Okay. So this is the Queer Principles of QWeb. And the premise is that there is a retired highwayman. This is 1750 London. Um, there's, a, there's a highwayman who got who got injured. And then he, since he can't be a highwayman anymore, he now is running a coffee house. And there is a um, like spoiled little shit of an aristocrat who needs to blackmail his father because of plot reasons. And so for other plot reasons, he needs to hold his father up to get a plot device from his father, okay? So to do that, he needs to hire a um, highwayman, okay? So that's the setup of the book. And this is the beginning. And I'm actually gonna read a little bit from the beginning and then I'm gonna read a little bit further on. And then depending on how slow I read, I might read something towards the end, but okay. November 1751. And I apologize again for like my American accent because I feel like if you could like envision, if you could like envision this being said in a totally different voice, it would, you know, give some atmosphere. Okay. Kit Webb had principles. He was certain of it. Even at his worst, which had reliably been found at the bottom of a bottle, he hadn't hurt anyone, at least not too badly. Well, at least not on purpose. Better perhaps to say that he never threw the first punch. As far as daggles and daggers and pistols, he found waving them about to be so effective that he never needed to resort to using them. Better not to dwell on whether this owed more to luck than to skill or any moral refinement on his part. Yes, he had lightened a few purses in his day, but nobody's purse wasn't altogether too heavy to begin with. He wasn't going to keep himself up at night worrying about what some or another lady was going to do with one fewer ruby diadem. Besides, that diadem had been murder defense, nearly put him off the entire enterprise of jewel theft altogether. Betty hadn't spoken to him for weeks. He much preferred coin, please and thank you. He did feel badly about the coachmen and outriders and other fools who got dragged into fights that were properly between Kit and the great and good of the land. But he figured that any poor sod who was fool enough to come in to come between a highwayman and a guilt encrusted traveling coach got whatever they had coming to them, which, as it turned out, tended to be nothing more than a couple of well placed punches. But that was all in the past now anyway. He had turned over a new leaf started fresh, or as close to fresh as a man could when he was nearly 30 and all his acquaintances were criminals and the back room of his of his place of business was little more than a house of assignation as close to starting fresh as a man could get when three times a day some bastard walked past the coffee house singing that bloody fucking ballad about that one time he had escaped from prison. Yes, the escape had been dashing, but it wasn't even in the top 10% of his most impressive feats, and it was a sin and a shame that jail rhymed with so many words. Besides, his shoulders still hurt from where he had injured it and in squeezing through the barred windows, and the less said about the gunshot wound that had been allowed to fester during his week in prison, the better. And that ill-fated escape had followed hard upon Rob's death, which was not the sort of thing he wanted to be reminded of in lazily rhymed couplets. No, he probably didn't have any principles at all, sorry to say, but he could act like he did. In fact, he had to act like it, seeing as to how with his leg in this state, he could hardly continue to merrily thieve his way across England. He was the very model of what the preacher in Hyde Park was pleased to call a virtuous life, and the boredom of it would probably kill him. For 12 months now, Kit had lived the life of an honest and respectable shopkeeper. He turned his attention to running the coffee house, which he had bought some years ago on a drunken whim and then operated as little more than a convenient staging ground, a literal den of thieves. But these days when a customer came in with a purse full of gold and a head full of cotton wool, they left with both head and purse intact. And if the past year of trying to live a decent sort of life had only resulted in Kit getting more foul, temper more foul tempered by the day, it was probably his own fault for being so very bad at being good. He had to try harder, that was all. Still, sometimes after walking Betty home, after closing up at night, he almost wished footpads would come after him. He'd leap at the flimsiest excuse to fight back. Maybe that was why, when something that looked like first-rate trouble walked into Kit's coffee house, Kit felt like a bloodhound who had finally scented its quarry. Okay, so that's Kit, our highwayman. And now this is a couple of chapters later. This is Percy, our spoiled aristocrat who has already asked the highwayman to rob his father and the highwayman just like laughed him out of the coffee house pretty much. So this is 
this is Percy being persistent. Okay. Percy decided that it was high time to put the screws to the highwaymen. It had been days since their last encounter. And besides, the errand would get him out of Clare House, fill a few hours, and bring his father one step closer to public ruination. So all in all, a morning well spent. He took extra care with his toilet. It was a bleak and dismal day, so he chose yellow. It was not, he would concede, his best color, but one of the many advantages of beauty was that he could wear the ugliest conceivable color and still look better than almost everybody. He had Collins button him into his jonquil silk waistcoat and the saffron colored coat that was positively stiff with gold embroidery. A lesser man might find yellow breeches to be a bridge too far, but Percy was not a lesser man. He sailed into the coffee house with the maximum possible to do, only to find the place bursting with patrons. The weather was grim, so it stood to reason that these commoners would wish for a more hospitable environment than whatever hovels they undoubtedly hailed from. But he was disappointed to realize the table he occupied on his previous visits now seated four men in depressing black coats. But he could hardly leave, not after sweeping into the place as he had done. So he settled himself at the end of a bench at the long central table, adjusting his coat around him. He could feel Webb's gaze. He looked up, meeting the highwayman's eye. You'll be wanting coffee then, Webb grumbled. Webb grumbled. Yes, I am here for coffee, Percy said. How observant of you. No wonder this place is such a bustling success. Webb wordlessly plunked a cup of coffee onto the table, causing a not insubstantial quantity to spill over the rim of the cup. Percy ignored both the spill and the coffee. Good God, kid, said the man who sat beside Percy. You'll soak my book if you don't mop that up. Give me a rag, why don't you? Then, turning to Percy, the place goes to ruin without Betty here to see things. Ruin, I tell you. Ruin, Percy agreed, and apparently that was all one needed to do to strike up a conversation at a place like this, because then they were off. The man told him what a grave tragedy it would have been if Kit had managed to destroy his book when, he, when here he was, mere pages from the end. And that prompted Percy to confess that he hadn't read the book. You must take it, the man cried. His name was Harper or Harmon or possibly even Hardcastle. He spoke with a rustic accent that sounded like so much nonsense to Percy's ears. Also, also Percy did not much care what the fellow's name was. Here, said Harper or whoever he was, pressing the book into Percy's hands. I couldn't possibly, Percy said. If Percy wished to read this book about a Tom Jones or some such common sounding fellow, he would order a copy bound in the same green leather as the rest of his library. He would certainly not read a book that belonged to an utter stranger and which looked like it had been read by several people with hands in various stages of dirtiness. I don't wish to impose on your kindness. And you wouldn't be my good man. It's not my book, it's Kit's. Harper gestured at a wall on the far side of the room lined with bookcases and hardly visible through the tobacco smoke. Is Mr. Webb running a lending library as well as a coffee house? Percy asked, the mind boggled at the career choices of retired highwaymen. That, said a man across the table, not looking up from a paper in which he had been furiously scribbling, would imply that he charged. I do charge, interjected, interjected Webb, who was stomping around the table collecting empty cups. No, you don't, said the man across the table. You're supposed to put an extra penny in the bowl. Nobody does that, Harper told Percy in confiding tones. You just take the book and put it back when you're done. And put a fucking penny in the bowl, said Webb. What are you all still doing here? Don't you have homes to go to? Harper left soon after, shoving the book in front of Percy as he went. Percy ignored it, preferring instead to watch Webb at the fire, poke at the fire and grumble at the pot of coffee that brewed near the hearth. Around supper time, the crowd at the coffee house began to thin. Percy really ought to be going as well. When he checked his watch, he discovered he had been sitting on a hard wooden bench for three hours. He had read four pages of the novel, idly listened to a debate that sounded shockingly seditious on both sides, and spent the rest of the time watching Webb. He watched Webb sweep, add what seemed to be utterly indiscriminate and unmeasured quantities of herbs to the coffee pot, pour coffee in a way that could only be described as reluctant, shelve a pile of books in a manner that could have nothing to do with the alphabet, and tell about three dozen patrons that Betty isn't here, goddamn you, just drink your coffee and get out. Percy knew nothing about shopkeeping and would have been gravely insulted by anybody who suggested otherwise, but he had spent enough money at enough places to know that Webb's manner of running his business was both eccentric and not especially likely to encourage customers to return. But still, the place had been full every time Percy had seen it. Maybe they were, maybe, maybe they were all there to admire the proprietor. There was certainly a lot of him to admire. 
Even his scowl didn't ruin his looks. He had the jaw to carry it off, making the scowl into a proper manly glower. Stop staring at me like that, Webb said when the two of them were alone in the shop. He didn't look up from his coins. No, I don't think I shall, Percy said. You'll get yourself arrested if you carry on acting like that. Percy raised his eyebrows. I have to say, I wasn't expecting to receive counsel on being a law-abiding citizen from you. Webb made a noise that it took Percy a moment to realize was a laugh. Webb recovered himself immediately and scowled at Percy, as if he were cross with Percy for being amusing. You're not going to tell me that a man like you minds a brush with the law, Percy said. Webb gave him an odd look, but, it's st but still there were no offended dramatics about him not being that sort of man, how dare Percy, et cetera, and so forth. The man wasn't even blushing. Okay, so that's what I've got. Any questions?